Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode from Scale Up Thursday series. My name is Rashmita, and I'm the event planner for Microsoft Reactor India. I'm here today joined by our very own host. Hey, Vivek. Hey, Vinayak. And Hello, of course, our very good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, with Vinayak and Vivek, we have our special guest speaker, Karan. But before we start our session today, I would request you all to read our code of conduct. We are all here to learn together. So please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, being kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat section is open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. Our speaker will answer all your questions during the session. So feel free to drop all your question in the chat section. With this, thank you all and enjoy the session. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you, Rashmita. Hi, all. Welcome to one more episode of Scale Up Thursday. I am Vivek, uh, Senior Cloud Advocate, and I have Vinayak with me. Uh, Vinayak, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vinayak Hegde, and I'm the CT in residence at Microsoft for Startups. As part of my work, I actually help startups, actually, um, especially the CXOs of startup, actually uh, scale their tech and product. And uh, prior to that, you know, I have worked with various startups. So I use that experience to help them scale uh, their tech and product. Um, yeah, so that's that's about me. Uh, uh, yeah, Vivek, we should, we should get Karan on as well. Yes, I'm just bringing in Karan. Hey, Karan, welcome to Scale Up Thursday show. And I let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Vivek. Hi, Vinayak, how are you? Hi, hi Karan. So, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, giving the opportunity to come on stage and, and share about our journey, our vision. Uh, I started my entrepreneurial journey almost six years back. Uh, my background is uh, I am an engineer. Uh, actually, I did chemical technology. Post that, I moved to data, data science, uh, coding, etc. 2010 to 12, I did my MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. I worked in a bunch of strategy and tech roles. Uh, eventually, in 2017, we decided to start something of our own. Uh, that's where, you know, since I worked in the media space uh, for the past few years, uh, I had a bit of idea as to what problem we should pick and what problem we should try and solve. So that's what we did in the last you know, few years. So more than happy to share my story regarding that. Sure, sure, Karan. I think I think that's a, a wonderful uh, journey you have had. Uh, because if I have to see the journey, right, I was just checking your uh, LinkedIn, just a bunch of roles you have played uh, from business, from being a chemical engineer to business roles and uh, co-founding different this is your second startup which we are discussing i believe the first startup is uh logic bricks uh so that is something which uh, we will definitely discuss uh you know what you did there as well you, you, you can just give us a, a some kind of uh, you know in, sure. insight into that as well um yeah good good Karen. so uh we actually started two companies around the same time uh so my wife and i my wife uh, you know we, we started together at iim she comes from a finance background. So we both decided to, you know, first start one company and then we had another idea. So we had a bunch of other co-founders who were interested in kind of working with us. So we started two companies together. I mean, maybe not the best thing to do as a first time founder, but, you know, we didn't really know much back in the day. Uh, so we hustled a lot. I mean, to 2017, when we started both companies, at least two, three years, we hustled a lot. We bootstrapped both companies. So we never raised capital. Uh, we uh, we we made sure that you know we, we kind of uh, be a profitable company from day one so obviously that also involves doing a fair bit of services uh, we've done all of that uh, really hustled so logibricks and reflection both are you know two totally different uh, you know companies in terms of the problems they solve the industries they they cater to so logibricks is more on the retail side so logibricks we started as an erp product which we built and then uh, in a couple of years, we realized it's very difficult to sell an ERP as a SaaS product in India to SMEs. Uh, so we decided to pivot it and we tried solving some problems for e-commerce. Um, mostly all of the D2C companies that, that you see these days. Uh, and in 2020, it really boomed. So 
<clears throat> Lord Bricks, he really kind of committed to make sure that you know we solve a problem where we can easily go SaaS. So it's a natural SaaS offering that that is that is there. Um, <clears throat> We also raised capital in Logibrix. We raised 1.5 million dollars in 2021, uh, uh, and you know we've really scaled the company now. Uh, probably in the next two three months, we'll even become profitable. So, team size 70, uh, 70 people, some great engineers. Uh, once we raised capital, we really scaled it. Uh, if you talk about reflection, it started as a as a as a enterprise uh, software company for you know focused on the media space media and entertainment that to more on the broadcasters, television broadcaster side. Uh, we, as I said, 2017, we had no idea about, you know, whether we should, what kind of a problem we should take and solve. So it was just kind of going with the flow, to be very honest. Uh, we solved a couple of very exciting problems like auto scheduling uh, on television, um, auto scheduling ads on television, you know, for, for television networks. Uh, so the problems were pretty unique. They were they were very different. Um, I mean, not many companies had even thought of something like that back in the day. Um, but in 2020, again, we realized that we should kind of move a little bit away from television um, and linear rather than uh, you know just kind of staying with something which is already shrinking. So we created a more mainstream AI product, you know, catering to video. Uh, so 2020 was that pivot. So it has been three years in that journey. It has been a crazy journey. I mean, I'd love to share what we've been through in the last three years. Uh, we've scaled the team to about 50 people. About 15 of them are data scientists. We have a very, very good team uh, in Touchwood. Uh, again, based out of Pune. So, yeah, I mean, uh, this has been the journey so far. And we've, you know, even reflection, we... So when we started building up on the idea, right? So after the first six months, we thought we should raise capital now when we kind of knew that there is a product market fit. We raised about 600K. Uh, we raised very minimal amount, just what we needed. And we've just kind of sailed through, you know, over the last two, three years with that money. So, yeah. So, 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 so quickly to understand, you know, um, what inspired you to, you know, build Reflection.ai? So what is the story behind... Uh, this problem statement which you have picked up, right? So what, what problem did you see in this space? Uh, why uh, you wanted to uh, solve this problem? And we'll get to how you solve that problem later, but um, let's talk about your uh, journey towards coming to the problem statement. So uh, in 2017, when we started working with media companies, uh, primarily television networks, uh, we I made a lot of friends, um, pretty much. I mean, we worked with most of the large broadcasters in India, some of them in the US as well. Even in my previous roles, I was in a media analytics company. So I built a good network of, you know, uh, professionals and people within the media community. Uh, when we were looking for, you know, a more mainstream product where we could utilize our, um, our capabilities that we built over the years in terms of AI ML, uh, that is where, you know, after speaking to so many people, we realized that, uh, that, you know, there is one area where, you know, we can really create a lot of moat. Having said that, to be very honest with you, at that time, probably that problem did not even exist. Um, so, so I'll just share a little bit about the problem. So what we thought we should, you know, kind of enable media professionals, uh, you know, empower them with was being able to search through video content. Um, so if, let's say, for example, there are thousand movie titles, right? Uh, somebody wants to look at, you know, kind of straight away get to scenes where, uh, say, Salman Khan is angry and holding a gun. I mean, we, we helped do that. So back in the day when we thought about this problem, to be very honest, uh, the bigger concern was whether this can be done or not. Um, and obviously, I mean, whether the problem really existed or not. So we thought, let's give it a shot. Uh, anyways, I think by that time, lockdown had hit. So they had a lot of time. Um, not much was happening anyways. So we gave a good three, four months to this. We built a very quick and dry uh, MVP. Uh, we took it to a few customers to check, to see what their feedback was. And it was a great feedback. So people realized that something like this can really save a lot of time for them. Uh, to give you an example, let's say there is an editor who is creating a promo of a movie. Uh, the editor takes about three days to do it to create one promo. 
out of which one and a half to two days goes only in watching the content over and over and logging the content manually. So if it is an action promo of a movie, you know, they would want to use scenes where there is an explosion, there is, you know, somebody is, there's some close combat, some gunshots. So all of this is, can be searched at a click of a button on reflection. So when we went and when we met customers with, you know, some kind of a basic solution, we realized that there is definitely a need. That is when we got serious about this problem and we thought we should raise capital, we should scale it. Um, since then, we've uh, invested 75,000 man days only in uh, labeling data for our AI models. So the kind of classes that we are able to identify now, it's own and with a reasonable level of accuracy is because of the fact that we invested a lot of time and money in collecting good quality data and training our models. So out of, I mean, the last two, three years has been more around, uh, you know, trying to solve this problem. And there, is, there have been, again, multiple pivots in this. We've, uh, at every point in time when we thought, no, we are, maybe we are not going in the right direction. We changed course. Probably every six months we've changed course. Uh, and that's how, you know, we, we are like today we are, we've done a, we've done a hard launch now. We're launching our product in the US in April. So yeah, I mean, things have taken off. Fantastic. I mean, um, it's an interesting journey. Like you, you thought about something which might, might not even exist as a problem for many. And when you went ahead and showed it to some of your, uh, potential customers and, they saw the problem. Yeah, we have this problem, and uh, that that's that's something an interesting story, a very different uh, startup story there. Uh, so, uh, so, so, Karan, let's move on to like uh, now. You understood uh, this is what you wanted to build, and you wanted to do a search in a in a video. Uh, let's move on to how did you build it, and uh, what is the strategy behind building it. Um, Karan, can you hear us? Oh, I think, oh, we lost Karan, is it? I think so. I think he's frozen. Uh, so I think yeah. uh, also, also I think they do uh, video annotation and subtitling also, yeah. right? So it allows the yeah. workflow uh, to uh, do that as well. Uh, so we'll wait for like Karan to kind of get back. Uh, but I think also, I think what is the, what is also interesting is the use of, uh, you know, they using their own models uh, from what I what I talked to them, and also they are using um, um, you know machine translation to do the translation also into different things. So I think in addition to the search and video analytics, I think you also can do like you know video annotation. Uh, uh, you know multiple different editors can collaborate. Uh, uh, um, you know uh, on the product as well. Um, mm -hmm. so so it's interesting because it's like kind of multifaceted and I think it's not just the editor, but also, you know, other people who can actually search, um, you know, there are certain um, um, features even in, uh, you know, other OTT platform that like, you know, if you click on the scene, it tells you like which actors are there in the scene, what's happening in the scene. Um, uh, oh, is it? And, uh, yeah, yeah. And you, you can kind of get to know, like, you know, you can add trivia. So. So even um, not just in the uh, video itself, but even in the player, as long as the player does support, you can also annotate, you know, certain specific events. So, uh, so for example, let's say if you if a particular uh, scene is actually uh, boring, or you know, you, like let's say you want to fast forward songs, um, actually you can have those kind of you know uh, automatic you know making of episodes also. So you can actually uh, you know seek seek to maybe certain scenes also. So that kind of as long as the player supports that, you can have that kind of annotation also in the, uh, also also in the, um, mm. uh, you know, in the video. Yeah, I mean, like the, one of the use cases he mentioned was the um, the how he went to some of these people who generate those uh, trailers, and uh, when he gives this kind of a tool to them, it's pretty easy for them to create uh, rather, you know watching for three days and doing some work for three days uh, just reduces the time uh, to create or build something like this. Um, so th I think that is one of the biggest use case, I believe, like this bunch of people who create trailers every day um, all over the world. And this particular tool can solve that problem. That's an interesting use case. And there might be a couple of more 
use cases uh, maybe once yeah, he's back also, yeah so trailer as well also also in the editing right like in the editing yeah. process i think the multiple people involved right? so where you want to maybe like cut the shot and uh, you have so much raw footage so uh, eventually i think the film as as people keep on saying is also made at the editor's desk because what the editor shows you actually does that right for example uh, even in photography for that matter right like what do you what you show in the picture and also what you don't show in the picture how do you place it uh how do you sequence it all of that matters and most of the time in when you are kind of doing editing actually goes in actually seeking ahead and you know finding out that right scene the place to cut to sequence the uh sequence of uh, videos arrange the arrange the sequences in the right order and then finally kind of you know merging all of that together so that becomes uh real trick and i think what is also unique about i think reflection also i think uh, a lot of this is also happening in the back end but also a lot of this is also happening in the browser which is a uh, which is which is very unique because most of the people have most of the software in this domain that i have seen almost almost all of the software is uh, desktop based so uh, like you, you run a executable so i think that is also something that is uh, kind of unique right? yeah true i i think yeah having a saas based uh, product is is much better and i we have not i have not seen much of this as project uh, in editing videos it's more of more of uh, in, you know in, you install it on your system and then you edit videos and other stuff very less in the market as well so we'll wait for current uh, to come uh, while we are waiting if the audience have any questions uh, related to found us up as well there is a video which we played um, which which was uh, about the founders hub uh, when we started this particular stream so if you are interested to uh, join founders hub uh, if you are a startup and if you have an idea as well um, you can apply and the link to apply is coming at the bottom and you can take a look at that there is a reference email id as well uh you can use that reference email id and uh, get started with it so uh karan is back so i had some very yep. weird uh, windows issue so my laptop uh, shut down it rebooted i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you you're just uh, talking about your product right you know how it can also be used for collaboration and uh, not just can you also of... share your uh, just before that you know, just can you share this, your slides as well so yeah yes yes yeah go ahead vinayak sorry yeah you know we were just talking about a product like since you know i'd seen the product uh, you know it can, how it can be used for uh, collaboration as well uh, um and uh, um it's not just like the editor right like as i said like you also said like the editing also uh, once you have the raw footage actually doing the editing uh, is also a lot of task and most of it involves like seeking to the right point and then actually making the cut and then sequencing it and i think also what is unique about your product current i think what i was telling the audience also is i think a lot of this is happening uh, in the back end but also in the browser i believe right most, because most of the software in this domain actually runs on the uh, desktop uh, so so that is also something i think maybe as we go on we'll talk about so so i'm just giving an overview since i you know i have kind of seen the evolution of product over a period of time uh, yes. yeah Cool. So I think I think we can start off. So uh, Karan, maybe uh, uh, you can take over, and you know we can go to the slide deck also now. So uh, I mean, let me just connect that with the story as well. Uh, so we when we started, the idea was to build a piece of tech that can read a video and tag it using artificial intelligence, using computer vision, audio models. Uh, so we've come a long way from there. Uh, so this is where we started we thought you know we had a hunch that this is a problem which needs to be solved which people were not even aware of back in the day um, and then when we started meeting customers a year later um, you know we got the feedback that there are a lot more use cases that can come out of this piece of tech um, to name a couple of them one is content moderation which is basically ensuring that the content is compliant with the regulatory standards of the country where the content is going to be aired um to give you an example in in india you know whenever there is a smoking scene or a drinking scene there needs to be a statutory warning on the on the screen on the frames uh some more examples could be let's say in the uae you know you really cannot have alcohol scenes at all 
So if you end up doing that, it is considered non-compliance and your channel can even get banned for a, for a few months. And, you mm-hmm. know, and there could be a hefty monetary fine as well. Uh, you know, other religion scenes cannot be there in, you know, in, in the Middle East. So there are many, many such, uh, you know, use cases that we identified in terms of content compliance, which we started uh, working on. Uh, and one more thing that, you know, you just uh, raised was, you know, when somebody has to create a highlight or a promo or a trailer, uh, you know, they have to do a lot of cutting, you know, finding the right section, cutting them, joining them and all of that. Uh, it can be very well done using AI uh, automatically. So the level of AI that we've built, you know, we can actually cut 10 comedy scenes of one minute each from a movie. Okay. So we can identify comedy scenes. We can identify action scenes, romantic scenes and so on. So using a lot of tags which are generated, which could be, you know, actors, emotions, uh, the actions that people are performing, uh, the sounds that are there at the back end, uh, the the background sounds. So a lot of data, dialogues, etc. are used to, to generate highlights automatically. Um, and along the way, we realized that, you know, we were actually providing dialogue search as one of the features um, and we hit a, we hit a or an opportunity to to generate revenues uh, by subtitling the entire content. So again, something that was largely done manually by a lot of companies. Um, we thought we should probably take a shot at this, and we're actually making a lot of money just subtitling content for customers. And for I think everything that we spoke about, uh, we've built our own proprietary models. We've collected our own data. So, uh, except for obviously translating into other languages where we used Azure Cognitive API, uh, everything else we we built in house. So, so uh, do you also do like the voiceover? Uh, like, do you also? I mean, I, I get that you're doing the um, uh, translation of other languages, but also do you kind of uh, do the voiceover also, tra- like the voice into other languages, or uh, not not that yet? Is that on the roadmap? That's not even on the roadmap. It is a totally different uh, and a very, very big problem to solve. It's a very hard problem to solve. Uh, we've definitely thought about it at some point, auto dubbing, but it's very tough to replicate emotions, pitch, tone, and being and automatically generate a voice which is fit for for you know for a for a character. So it's very difficult to do that. So I'm sure there'll be many companies that will come in, come and they only solve this problem. So, yeah, we have actually. I mean, we did. We have talked to two other companies uh, on this particular show, which are uh, the which are doing exactly this, uh, which is why uh, you know, which is why I asked this question also. And again, I I know that the problem is also very tough, uh, especially voice, uh, to get the tone, the pitch, the pacing, uh, the inflection, uh, all of that uh, really right. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so that that's interesting. So yeah, please go on. Yeah, so we restricted ourselves to subtitles because subtitles is relatively easier to solve. To be honest, we never wanted to get into it, but it is a big revenue opportunity. Uh, mm-hmm. So we thought of building a vertically integrated platform that auto generates subtitles and also gives uh, the user an option to correct the mistakes manually on a very good interface. That's why we built that to whole solution. Uh, and very easy for us to upsell to any existing customer. In fact, most of the customers right now are upsells from uh, you know, somebody who was using AI tagging or, you know, some other features that, that we provide. So it was an upsell for, to them and they realized that there is this kind of a feature available. They started testing it out. They liked the accuracy. They thought that, you know, they could do this in less time as well. That's why they mm-hmm. kind of started using it. So anyway, so coming to the first point of being able to search through content, uh, we built a piece of tech, which we were very proud of, honestly, like uh, about two years back. When we went to the customers, uh, we kind of got a reality check. Uh, we understood from customers that, you know, there's, to be honest, there is, nobody is kind of willing to pay a lot of money for this, number one. Uh, so we need to really bring the cost down. Uh, number two, you know, there are, there are also uh, issues around, uh, you know, whether this is actually a need or not. Uh, so the end users of this kind of a service would be editors and editors are never going to open a web application and you know search for certain things and then go back to their adobe platform where they are editing and then use those inputs there that's never going to happen 
so we realized from i mean we understood from the market that there is a need to create plugins uh, so that editors can use the ai search services directly in, an, in any editing platform like premiere or final cut pro or any other platform number 2 there is also a need to create rest apis which can be used in any other platform that any company is using so typically every media company uses something called as a media asset management platform there are like hundreds of them uh, they would never want to switch platform they were never 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 want to switch from their existing platform to reflection just to be able to use the service they would want to use the service at a backend they would definitely there is value in this service if provided at the at the right price uh, but switching platforms is not an option right so we understood this and we worked on two two areas one we were earlier tagging at a frame level at 25 fps uh, we were using heavy gpu machines etc so we the costs were very high in fact the initial cost that we were offering to our customers was somewhere around 25 to 30 dollars per hour of content right uh, people were not i mean there was very limited market that we could kind of even um, have as a target market at that price point so what we did was we had an eureka moment and we realized that if we can break the content down into shots which are camera shots and only infer a few frames for every camera shot we could really bring the cost down so we pivoted from something like this where we are providing frame level uh, results to something like this where we are providing short level results and our cost got down by 80% so that we could then offer, yeah, yeah yeah we could then offer that service uh, to a customer at you know a 5 to 6 dollar price point which is a very very sweet spot even if you look at you know anybody like like let's say microsoft for their ai services or aws recognition google vision uh, if you multiply the cost based on the number of frames etc it would come to 40 50 dollars an hour that is not the price point where you know somebody can operate because this is not an essential need this is you know helping the customer save time for their editors right there is a limited dollar value that you are saving for them you can only charge them that much so that is where i think this was pretty much a game changer for us i want to even show a demo as to how we've cracked this number 2 we started focusing heavily on plugins since we realized that you know these editors are never going to open a web based or platform or a mobile app which is where we uh, launched our adobe plugins and uh, davinci resolve and avid media composer final cut is in the works uh, also uh, exposed rest apis and started talking to these media asset management platforms so we are currently in the process of partnering with these platforms already in contact with more than 20 large platforms throughout the world um, and to be uh, i mean one of the good things for us was that these platforms they've already identified the fact that tags need to be saved so architecturally they support the concept of saving tags which are manual tags and few of them have even gone to the extent of you know integrating with an aws recognition or any other ai platform out there just to provide that as a service to some of their customers so for us to come in at this point it is very easy because the architecture is fully set customers are also aware that you know that some kind of a service of tagging can be used in the media asset management platform so we come at a very very sweet time at a good price point where we think we can really disrupt the market having said that it is not just the price point to be very honest with you uh, larger platforms would never go to the depth of solving specific problems of any sector right uh, to be like to give you some examples uh, would somebody you know go to the length of tracking a smoking scene with a high level of accuracy uh, or would somebody want to kind of maybe uh, factor in for let's say somebody kicking or punching somebody in the face and these are very specific media problems which no large platform would solve um, on the compliance side you know there are things we are doing which i can tell you that in years people would not really go to that level of depth so intoxication gore sexually explicit content violence or these are things that you know we've taken months to solve these problems uh, and we've also tested let's say for, for, for example smoking right we've tested uh, for cigarette as an object uh, in 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 one of the platforms and the level of accuracy that we that we get there versus what we've been able to achieve there is a huge difference 
there have been POCs that our customers have conducted where they've compared us with these large platforms as well, just to find out the level of accuracy. So this level of depth for somebody to get to this level, I mean, they would need specific focus on the industry. So there will be a number of other startups that will come that will try and solve these problems. But for a, to expect a larger company to come and solve this is, is not going to happen. Then talking about highlights, again, it, uh, I mean, in, to be very honest, we never approached any customer uh, and told them that, you know, we are going to automate the entire process of highlight creation. We know that something like this is, I mean, although it might sound disrupting, but it will also disrupt jobs, right? It will make, it will kind of threaten people. So we never thought of building something that could replace the process of creating a promo or, you know, having that human uh, hunch of what kind of shots to be taken in a, in, a, in a highlight or in a promo. But we are pitching to customers that we can augment their editors. We can help them. We can save their time. Whatever they used to do in three days, they can now do it in one day and so on. Uh, so basically, you will generate the uh, generate the uh, trailer, but I mean, leave agency in the hand of the editor to see whether to whatever the AI selected makes sense or not, right? Because the the editor would know, you know, uh, like let's say if it's action, we want to have all of the action scenes, maybe the car blowing up in there, or you know, like the hero actually walking out of a fire. I mean, those kind of scenes are very uh, sought after in trailer. So maybe you kind of highlight those, but I think. Because the storyline also is known by the editor, I think there is human input in terms of you know how how it, the trailer should be stitched together as well. I'm guessing. Yes. So, so it's absolutely. like a, that's why it's like an augmentation kind of solution. Yeah. Yes, it is an augmentation kind of a solution, and uh, you're right that human touch is very very necessary. So in fact, what we give as an output is not even a cut uh, content. We give something called as an EDL. EDL is basically the list of time codes that the AI has chosen for this kind of a highlight. And the EDL can directly be imported in Adobe or any other platform. And they can actually get to see that in the timeline, in the premiere timeline or any other timeline. So augmentation is something that we were focusing on. Uh, but having said that, there are a few other things here which we can solve very well using AI. One of the things is converting a highlight to a reel. So when you convert a highlight to a reel, essentially what you're doing is the 16 is to 9 uh, aspect ratio needs to be converted to 9 is to 16. So you need to identify who is the main character, where exactly is that character in the frame because he may not always be at the center. Sometimes there may be two people talking, so left and right. So being able to identify who is the person who's talking um, and tracking that person like from frame to frame and then aut automatically being able to cut that into a reel. So that is something that we've totally automated. In fact, even providing the service to auto-publish to platforms like YouTube and all, uh, through OAuth, right? So, yeah, few things I think AI can solve really, really well, uh, but few things are kind of more of an augmentation where somebody can save time and you know get more inputs and do a much better job in terms of creativity. Right? So this so particular very... problem, yeah, sorry, sorry, go ahead. no, nothing. I, I have a very different question. Like, uh, if I am building reels, so I, I can I use this tool? Uh, just go ahead and use this tool do add my raw uh, recording there and can this you know this tool give me a proper uh, final reel and then i can go ahead and upload it on my instagram i mean as a b2c i'm talking about as a consumer as a simple guy who is building reels yeah so uh, we've always thought about who we should go after and um, you know, one of the things that we really want to stick to is businesses. We, we don't want to, at least in the next two, three years, we don't want to go to the level of uh, reaching out to consumers. However, if, you know, there, somebody is, is an influencer and is ready to pay and use the service, they can definitely use it. Currently, obviously, it is in closed beta. We are still testing it. Uh, but in three, four months when it is available, anybody can register on reflection and start using this as a paid service. Uh, but for us to you know, tweak our GTM to reach out to consumers, that is a totally different ball game. In just businesses, the problem itself is so huge that, you know, that itself should take care of, of you know, of us and our time and so on. Got it. So there is, there, there is one question, actually. 
I don't know whether you're going to touch about this uh, later or now, but it is more on the GAN models you are using. Uh, I think you will be talking about that later in, in the architecture. We'll talk about that later because I have yeah. a few slides on the tech side as well. Got it. Yeah, so, so I, I think we, yeah. yeah, so I think in the, in the interest of time, I was thinking if you can just uh, move on and talk about the tech, unless I think Vivek, there are any questions that you want to uh, take as No, well. nothing. Yeah. Nothing, I think we can go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let me uh, kind of, you know, maybe before I move on, jump on to the tech, let me give a small demo of the platform. Sure. So this is the platform. Uh, where... Can you zoom in? Can you zoom in a little bit? Okay, nice. One second. Is it... Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether zooming uh, would be the right just, thing to do. Just try control plus plus. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, or command plus plus. Yeah. 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 I think it's okay. So this is, is better. Good. This is yeah. better. Yeah. Zooming reminds me that you know there was one feature when when we built this user interface of video player, uh, we wanted to factor in for all the, for different zoom levels, right? And it took us almost three, four months to crack this. And at any Zoom level, you know, the, it should be optimized. That That is interesting. And also, I think maybe, uh, I think as we go on, I think you should also talk about it. You know, what are the challenges building this to the browser? Because the browser itself is not, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it was, the browser was initially built for, you know, rendering HTML and CSS, uh, actually just HTML. And then the CSS came along and then it, the browser has become more and more of an app platform. Uh, and, uh, yeah, especially video is like very, very intensive, uh, to do and tough to do. I know that at least a couple of companies trying that, but I know that it's not very easy. It comes with its own set of limitations. So yeah, as you go on, maybe you talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. So we, um, at some point we thought of also providing very basic editing services on the browser, but that was totally a wrong decision. So we realized that it is much better to uh, partner with other editing platforms because everybody talks on certain uh, common uh, points like EDL, the one I was talking about. Uh, so working with these editing platforms is much better than creating your own. But when any entrepreneur starts working on a problem, I think there is this tendency to solve a lot of things around the problem, which is mm -hmm. not always right. Like if, if I give you an example of what we've done here, right? Uh, We've, there was actually no no reason to build a fancy platform, uh, you know, where uh, people can do a lot more things like uh, changing statuses or giving comments or, uh, you know, adding more users, etc. To be very honest, just building a simple platform which, uh, which just gave an opportunity for somebody to upload their content or maybe not even doing that, just leaving everything to the plugin. If we are targeting editors, editors or, you know, any other media professionals who use other platforms, just the integration probably could have solved the problem. But when we started working on this, we thought, you know, let's build a very fancy platform and uh, provide more, provide more. That's where we, the idea of building an editor also came into, into this, uh, into our thought process. But eventually we thought, no, that's not the right way to go about it. So uh, if you talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, certain capabilities to be provided on web there it's not much to be honest uh, we've used mm -hmm. react as a as a as a user as a ui technology for for this that too we started uh, paying the tech debt you know only after about one one and a half years of starting mm -hmm. work on this on this as a problem um, so this was i think early 2022 20, that we started building this on on react the use the ui uh, mm -hmm. and we started working on the tech Three years back, we started with a monolith, uh, service-oriented architecture, but monolith. There was no vision on how this has to scale, how many customers we would have, how many videos there would be on the platform, and so on. Um, so we started from that approach to you know, you know starting doing microservices um, architecture. So we, we currently have 50 microservices that that power this whole thing, um, using a lot of lot more. Uh, suited databases so we started with postgre only but now we have postgre we have cassandra uh, we have elastic search we have redis for caching so 
we've started using a lot more suited components for the platform mm-hmm. for different kinds of different kinds of problem uh, at the back end we started with dotnet dotnet core uh, mm-hmm. we are now on you know for certain microservices which are which are core to the platform we use uh, .NET 6 or .NET 7 in some cases. Uh, for certain others, like say, sending notifications, web sockets, we use Node.js. And for a lot of AI that we've built and deployed, we've used Python. So whichever is the is the right choice of tech, we've kind of used that. Um, let me also show you. Uh, yeah, so that that's interesting. So I want to kind of call out that point, right? So I mean, I do tend to talk to a lot of startups, and I think generally uh you know uh, and there's a video also that i put on this uh, on founders university so generally ask them to uh, use um, a dynamical type language maybe like javascript python ruby and then also use like as as they become more backend heavy and you know services move to the cloud and they want correctness i think having like a strongly typed language uh, really really helps right so you kind of mentioned uh, uh, .NET and uh, uh, c sharp probably is what you're using uh, uh, there, so I think that kind of becomes uh, a really good, and because you have microservices, I think you can version. Uh, once you are monolith and break it into microservices, I think once you version, each of the monolith, each of the microservices can then be like separately, can have a different language, which is best for that, right? So for example, you said that if there's any kind of machine learning here and you have libraries, and maybe use Python, uh, but like you're doing notifications, right? I think maybe. Maybe use like something like Node.js. So you can actually, in some sense, uh, choose the best language uh, or the framework for that particular microservice. And basically, everybody, since they're talking through uh, either some something like RPC or uh, through REST, uh, can kind of communicate with each other, right? So you kind of then, and I, I, that I think, uh, Karan, I think that might also be interesting because I think that will have an impact on your team also because as your team grows, you also kind of start specializing in a particular stack. So you will have somebody who's good at Node.js, others who are good at Python and so on. So the team also starts specializing in that particular way. So I think that evolution is very interesting to see because you know we often talk about it, but uh, you yourself have talked about it. And I, I just wanted to kind of highlight that part uh, you know, to start us because that evolution of the stack and the team uh, and the services and the architecture itself actually is like joint at the hip and goes hand in hand. As, as the as the feature set kind of evolves yeah i mean when we when we talk about a monolith you don't really need a, a big team right we you just so we had a team of about 10 12 engineers when we first started working on this now we have close to 30 engineers 15 data scientists right so we i mean when you think of microservices when you think of solving a much bigger problem with a larger scope i mean choice of technology is one thing that you know you need to kind of do this really well uh, so you obviously need to hire people who are good at Python, who are good at Node, Java, .NET, whatever the case may be. Um, mm. uh, from you know, if you consider us, uh, when it came to U- UI, I mean, we kind of thought that we should build the skills in house and make everybody full stack. So, mm. um, so everyone who's worked on on the UI is somebody who's who is already doing backend. So we kind of scaled that way in terms of UI. But if you look at other technologies, in fact, you know, there, there are certain specialists in Python for sure. But if you look at more Node, probably it's it's the same team that did .NET that learned core uh, Node and then uh, implemented it. So, but yeah, understanding the right choice of tech for the kind of problem was very important. So if you look at this, right? So this is the main transactional part which we've created in .NET Core, uh, which includes the collaboration part of giving comments, the entire um mm. uh, all the transactional data related to it the users etc um there are certain activities that we do once a video is uploaded like creating thumbnails uh creating proxies the lower resolution proxy uh videos conversion from one format to another format uh metadata of the video we also help with pdf and image processing so all of this as well so all of this is best done on python so mm. that's what we did and on the AI side, if you look at vision and audio, obviously Python is the best choice of tech to uh, to write any um, uh, computer vision or any audio model. Uh, I mean, debatable, but but mostly yes, easy to find as well. So mm-hmm. frame extraction, short segregation, face detection, emotion detection, objects, places, many more, right? Are all microservices uh, which are built on Python. 
uh, on the vision side, similarly on the audio side as well, transcription, subtitling, and so on and so forth. Uh, how creating some microservices helped us is that whenever somebody, let's say somebody is uploading 100 videos, we are processing all 100 videos at the same time. Hmm. So we create multiple pods. Yeah, so you can spin up and spin down uh, those microservices. Also, another question I had uh, since, I mean, again, maybe this is something that you're thinking about is uh, what I've realized in my own journey is, you know, uh, having solved uh, not this specific problem, but similar kind of machine learning a problem is maybe initially you build it in Python and but I think for the sake of efficiency, maybe what you realize is maybe Python is not that fast because again, it's uh, 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 anything that is CPU intensive, you want to probably have one strongly typed and also uh be it more efficient so do you see do you kind of see or are you at that point where you feel that maybe some of these services which are in python can be rewritten in maybe some other statically typed language or do you feel that maybe there's still some time to go that because that point invariably will come as you have more and more videos more and more customers because yeah, cost, the cost of running the microservices also will start kind of showing up on the uh on the cost side yeah yeah i think you are perfectly right that you know, at the right time, we have to take these decisions. Uh, I mean, like when we started, you know, most of most of the stuff that we were using was not even managed service. We kind of built small VMs, started working on it, but the cost of managing it was much higher than actually paying for the managed service. So at some point, we realized that we should use a lot of managed services. In fact, you know what, when we started, we built our own identity server as well to store user passwords, etc. But then we thought, I mean, there is absolutely no need to do this uh, heavy lifting. Rather, let's, let's just use Azure ADB to see um, many yeah, other yeah, things that are available out there. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't add anything to your product. I think, I think, absolutely. I think you can. I think your kind of innovation and what you can do the most is absolutely. probably the AI, uh, vision, audio. That is that is the core, right? And anything in some sense peripheral, you can just probably use whatever is in some sense best of class. And I think as an engineer, also, I think you know personally, also I've struggled with it, right? Because you want to. Uh, we are builders, you want to build, but again, like choosing not what to build and what to focus on, uh, especially a startup with a very constrained and small team actually is very, very important. So yeah, I wanted to kind of highlight also. I think, I, th I think that's a very interesting decision and journey also in terms of the stack evolution. Absolutely. What, what is your, what is your cluster in production looks like, uh, like, like Azure Kubernetes uh, cluster you have, how many worker nodes, uh, usually you have for, uh, running such a intensive uh, i product. wouldn't have those specific numbers uh but i would be happy to kind of maybe send a note after this session on the specific numbers of number number of nodes etc but as just to give you a higher level this thing uh, idea of this we have about 50 microservices uh if i just talk about the process of uh say uh, uh you know uh, this entire process of ai tagging right so there is this uh, I, I don't think I have that handy, but I'll just explain. Um, so as soon as somebody, um, triggers the, you know, the, the need to tag a content, let me just show you an example. So this is a video that some, somebody uploads a video and opens it. There is an option of what all needs to be tagged, right? Um, Mm -hmm. categorized into different categories once mm -hmm. i select this and i hit run it will start for every single uh, uh you know model which we've kind of decided to have as a separate microservice it will create a pod right it will mm -hmm. run that this specific video on that pod so if there are 100 videos that are requested at the same time it will create 100 pods for each of these mm -hmm. features that we are trying to do and it happens in a sequential manner so for example the first thing that we do is we uh, uh, do frame extraction. So we extract at 25 frames per second. We store the frames in block storage. Number two, we do short segregation because now we've started uh, doing inferencing at a short level. Then if somebody has requested, let's say emotion, right? So the first thing that happens is detecting faces, right? This happens first and all the faces are detected. All those faces go through emotion model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it happens in a sequential manner and certain other certain models would be prerequisites to other models. So that's how we've kind of modeled it. Uh, and there is a task manager that handles this entire approach. Similarly with subtitles as well, what is the language? 
and how many other languages do you need subtitles in so all of this can be selected got it so even if i select the emotions uh, model uh, the face detection model and emotion model together it runs at two pods or just one pod no it runs two pods face detection is a so okay. we used to do earlier we used to do everything on the same vm which was a gpu vm but then now we thought no we'll run everything on cpu because we need to auto scale this like anything so it first so face detection is another uh, pod uh, and okay. then face uh, face detection is one face recognition is one facial attributes is one and emotion is one to run okay. facial attributes emotion and face recognition you need to have face detection as a prerequisite interesting so i think so, i think also i think i think one end of the spectrum is uh, you know you running everything on a vm i think but i think running everything as a kubernetes part also i feel is a work i think there is a happy middle again it's not uh, it's it's not easy because you know you have to figure out you know how does your absolutely. service composition look how do you sequence all of that kind of knowledge is there uh, but i think at some point you will probably have to consolidate because uh, the amount of time you're spending in uh, uh, in actually storing and retrieving i think the handoff can uh, can be done by you know composing different services uh, kind of together in a better way right currently if you're yes uh, if, if you're scaling each of them individually for 100 videos i think there is a lot of time in handoff between different services so i think again like uh, you know there is it's not an easy problem to solve uh, because you know you need like as i said like the sequencing is important but also i think the uh, i think a little bit more thought may be interesting would be interesting in terms of how do you compose and use those services together for example can you kind of dynamically create pipelines where you know you can pipe the output of one uh, maybe service into another seamlessly uh, by using some kind of orchestration would be interesting rather than you know going back and storing to um, like, said, like doing frame extraction uh, to blob storage again that might be in some sense be an unnecessary step again something to think about uh but uh, yeah the interesting level less so again i i think what i'm liking about this conversation is like how you have evolved and you know these decisions are again not easy uh because it depends on so many different factors as engineering right number of videos uh amount of management how do you write code uh you know what are the people's expertise how do you compose i think these are like not easy problems i think they evolve over a period of time and what is i think most interesting for a lot of people on this is that how it has evolved over a period of time absolutely yeah but right that at different points in time i think we need to start thinking how to optimize further and there is also a cost benefit analysis that we need to keep doing at every point uh, if we are incurring more costs in running vms maybe think of managed services and the other way around as well so yeah i mean it's a it's an evolving uh, story for sure so so current let's see one demo now yeah so this uh, this video we've already pre tagged it uh, and you know these are the tags that have got generated right there are emotions there are actors there are some unknown faces there are these objects um also on the smoking drinking compliance side there are few other things if i want to look for say this actor i hit search so it is fetching from the database and it will give it it took about 2 3 seconds um so it is a data intensive process plus we've also remodeled after this uh initially we were storing these tags in cassandra uh, but then we realized that that is not the best choice of tag so we moved it to elastic search and i'll show you the results with elastic search as well but you know these are the kind of results that we get you know for at the frame level whichever frame you select it will give you the all the results that are there in that frame interesting and if you i mean if you see how we've bettered this to show you an example a recently uploaded video that we tagged at a short level so we've launched this again in beta because we're still testing it but the same thing will be at a short level so this actor freddy haymore i search i just clicked and i got it and right? mm. so it's extremely fast and now there is less data as well there is a better choice of data warehouse than cassandra for this kind of a thing and this is how so the results are rather than every frame the results are in and out time so so this shot was from here to here so this is the in and out time of this match and this can be extracted as an edl can be uploaded to premier directly so all of these results will show on the premier timeline that are that are shown here interesting 
so yeah i mean typically this is the main switch that has happened for us in terms of performance in terms of architecture in terms of cost uh, if you look at another thing which which i was talking about which is the subtitling angle right so once the subtitles are created i mean you can never using ai you can never generate 100% accurate subtitles so we've created this editor where the subtitles can be edited manually they can, they can be corrected manually whoa, whoa. Uh, somebody can run it and easily see the subtitles okay hmm. no this is cool because like it is like in the place that you are actually working so uh yeah so maybe maybe the tagging of the time is right but uh, uh because subtitle that also matters right tagging of the time so if you get that right maybe the uh, maybe the addiction or uh, detection is wrong so then correct it in place and then just save it so yeah, this is this is brilliant actually because yeah, being this was a re- this was a really big problem getting the time right and we've done this obviously this is with 100% accuracy but you can still change it you can move it here and there there are other uh, you know sub- subtitle settings like how many lines you want uh, maximum characters per line minimum gap between subtitles so there are a lot more uh, you know uh, guidelines to creating subtitles than meets the eye so we've tried to build all of this in along with the ai services that we give in terms of creating the subtitle itself but if somebody doesn't want to use ai they want to do it manually even then they can do a much better job so they can probably if they have some subtitles they can upload them here uh using this and then once they upload they can straight away start seeing the subtitles they can start editing the subtitles here so if i want to add some type something here or split subtitles or join two subtitles um so so, so once you want yeah yeah so once you have the subtitles do you kind of uh uh have them as a separate files like you know srt files for example i generated yes. sometimes or do you so we, do you kind of render the video with the subtitles do you have that option as well because sometimes i've seen that the videos have subtitles kind of uh, burnt into the video itself yeah we, so that? this is this was again one major problem that customers faced they had to always have the subtitles file separate and the video separate so mm-hmm. there we, they wanted to build a feature where the subtitles can be burnt in which we given as a feature and subtitles okay. can also okay. be exported directly as an srt or uh, vtt or multiple there were 10 12 different formats but when we save it it is saved in a database format in a, in an sql database format uh, and from there we based on the on the guidelines that people choose etc based on this we actually create the subtitles file we store it as a text and then it can be uh, downloaded and you can burn it to the video yeah either it can be burned into the video or it can be downloaded separately yes. with those kind of settings yes. Yes. So, so this is where you are using uh, Azure Cognitive Services, is it, to convert it yes. into text, yes. audio to text, no. and we we do the transcription with. Uh, so at some point we were using Azure models, but when we started giving dialogue search as a feature, mm-hmm. which was a very basic feature, we had to build a transcription model ourselves, even with a less level of accuracy. But we had to build it ourselves. But then we started working on it. When we started working on it, we collected a lot of training data. to make it better so in fact in terms of indian languages we are for some of the languages we are even better than in azure or aws or some other platforms but in terms of obviously english and french and german and spanish and all obviously we can only do limited but yeah i mean this was a decision that we took to build our own transcription model but translation obviously we do using using azure <laughs> got it so yeah i mean this is how it has i mean if i show you the earlier screens of this platform i mean you will not believe the 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 evolu- the level of evolution that we've we've had here even in terms of basic ui services of you know giving comments being able to annotate on the frame so this is all exported into a uh, different uh, uh... or is it like or this is like only for like use for communication internally so this is this is for internal communication this is the collaboration feature between okay. teams of a same of the same company or it could also be client and vendor so hmm. another example is an ad agency creating an ad and getting feedback from the advertiser is one hmm. of the things that this is used for so this problem is a relatively older problem that many companies have come into this and solved this problem but we thought that if we are building a platform 
let us give one more simple feature for somebody to kind of uh, be sticky with us. And this is actually working very well. To be honest, we have a lot of customers that actually got in through collaboration and now they started mm-hmm. using AI services as well. Mm-hmm. Got it. So there are a couple of questions. Uh, yes. Let me first bring up. Um, yeah, there is from one from Ashwin. I think you did answer it, but we can uh, specifically answer it to him. Like how many members of the team, like 50 microservices you have, you have answered it. Why? But how many um, team members you have in so, like 30, 30 developers yes, you mentioned? Yes, full stack developers, we have close to 30. And mm-hmm. uh, they are able to manage it very well. I'll, I'll show you how. Uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to get right because there are so many people, there are so many tasks. So we use Azure DevOps actually for all of our development, uh, even CI CD pipelines, uh, tracking the status of development and so on. Who has done what, what is pending, uh, total pending items, total close today, week, etc. So everything is tracked on a daily basis. Uh, we make targets at the start of the week as to what we want to do by end of the week and we make sure that we get it done. Um, and you know, we've also built uh, CI CD pipelines where uh, we've integrated something like a sonar cloud to auto uh, check the quality of code. Um, and, you know, obviously going through the dev QA staging and prod uh, kind of model of CI CD. So, this is something that we've done. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to handle 50 microservices, so many developments, so many changes. And all of this is actually on the UI side, if you look at it, it is all one page. So it's mm-hmm. not anything mm-hmm. that, you know, there are multiple pages like any other platform. It's one single page where we've kind of handled everything. So got it. Yeah, got it. So there is one more question uh, from Jagdish. Uh, what does EDL stand for? Uh, I think you spoke about some EDLs in the middle. I'm not sure. So EDL, I'm not EDL also is sure. it's a standard format for editing platforms. Um, okay. I, I don't remember the full form of EDL, but uh, it is basically in terms of data, it consists of time codes. So what I showed you, right, the search. So what you what you can export as an output is the time codes, which is uh, this start to end, this start to end, this start to end, this start to end, and so on. It gets extracted into a file, which is, I believe, see this EDL, search result EDL. And this can be directly uploaded to Adobe Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro or any other platform. Uh, they understand EDL well. This is much better understood than an XML or a JSON or a CSV. It's a very standard. Yes, so, yeah, so EDL is a edit decision list. Uh, edit decision so, list. Yeah. And they basically, as you said, like it contains, um, basically it's an annotation with uh, uh, the timeline, um, uh, you know, so that it it's ordered thing. So similarly, I think subtitles also have some similar information. Because time in the video, I think time is the main indicator of seeking. So basically, it doesn't overlay and you know allows you to seek to that point. So, EDL or edit, EDL or edit decision list is basically an annotation, mostly in terms of time, of where to start, where to stop, and uh, maybe any kind of comments or uh, you know stuff on layered on top of those timelines as well. True. Right. So, uh, I think somebody okay. asked a question on on GAN, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just to kind of make it clear, we are not into any kind of generative AI. Uh, that was never the objective. The objective was to solve a straightforward problem of being able to identify something in a content uh, than creating anything. So we we are, we are totally not into it. And there are a lot of startups that are focused on generative models where you can generate images, etc. Not us. Yeah, so I think uh, it, uh, because we have actually done the last show uh, with another startup called Professor Jim. I think for those who are listening, and uh, you can go and check the archives. And I think they actually uh, work on the other side of you know a video where actually uh, while Karan and his team is actually working on existing videos and enhancing them and editing them, I think the other part is actually generating videos and uh, you know being able to give voice and other things. So that is again that is a very hard problem, not easy to solve. Uh, so Professor Jim is one of the startups we have featured here. I mean, you can go and take a look at the archives uh, and uh, you know uh, see if you are interested in that that part as well. I'll just share the video. 
Oh, I mean, uh, uh, audience maybe, uh, is watching. Maybe. Yeah, if you have any questions, it. please. Yeah, please uh, let us know. And I think, Karan, maybe uh, I think since we're uh, done with the demo, maybe we can move back to the uh, the um, uh, architecture slide as well a little bit. So we'll talk a little bit more. Yes. We're just a little bit over time, but I just wanted to focus also on the fact, like you know, talk about specialization, obviously in Teams and the microservices, but also I think a little bit on maybe like the data, how you're storing data, and uh, in terms of the observability, if you can talk about that part as well. Because we talked about the other parts, uh, uh, but maybe I think about this part might be interesting as well. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, whenever somebody uploads content, uh, it goes into block storage. Um, also, for running AI models, uh, we extract frames, which are also stored in blob. Uh, any model that uses, that needs frames to do inferencing, directly uses it from block storage. So earlier, what we used to do was in the machine, we used to download all the frames and then we used to do the processing. We've totally changed that. And now we are directly using it from blog. Um, in terms of databases, we started only with Postgre first, but then we realized that there are certain types of uh, you know data which uh, need another type of database. So to give you an example, for a two hour movie, we are generating 1 million tags using AI. So we wanted to look at a better choice of uh, database than a Postgre uh, in terms of performance, in terms of speed, um, et cetera. So we, we initially started with Cassandra. So it was a Cassandra cluster with multiple nodes, three nodes, I think we were using. Uh, it was using, it was giving a decent level of performance, but eventually we thought of moving this to Elasticsearch and we totally converted it into objects and smaller objects, uh, which are stored at a short level. So that is why you could see a much, much higher level of performance because data is now stored in Elasticsearch as very small level objects. Um, we use uh, Redis for, you know, certain caching of data, storing temporary data and all of that. Um, nothing too, nothing too serious. Comments we still store in Cassandra. We've not moved the comments here because we are getting a very good level of performance as far as comments are concerned because Typically in one content, you would not have more than 50 to 100 comments. So very, very easily manageable in Cassandra. Uh, and you know, the way we do this is uh, typically, I mean, the best way to do it, do this is whenever somebody gives a comment, I mean, we don't do a server call right away. I mean, we first, when somebody gives a comment, we initially immediately change the state of the user interface. So for the user, it is done. And then at the back end, we start pushing this. Uh, we've even exposed Azure functions, uh, you know, and we hit the Azure function and directly it goes into uh, into a queue. So we use RabbitMQ, and then it starts, uh, you know, getting inserted into the databases database, uh, you know, by the queue. So this is how we've kind of optimized this. Even when somebody tries to like a comment or reply on it, all of this is like really fast uh, for the user. But on the back end, it goes through RabbitMQ and it kind of happens in a sequential manner. So, yeah, I mean, this is pretty much it. There are, I mean, the logs of uh, pods that are uh, that are that have been created, uh, the entire log of it uh, is done in Prometheus. And we've also connected it with the with Slack directly. So on Slack, we keep getting notifications if anything goes wrong in terms of CPU usage, in terms of um, you know, any pod that is getting created, we kind of get alerted instantly. We use obviously Grafana for Prometheus and Kibana for Elasticsearch. Um, yeah, I think on the database size, right, this is pretty much it. Uh, for yeah, for React, we we are using static web app. So we are, uh, I mean, since we expect to have customers throughout the globe, we thought, I mean, especially US, Europe, uh, it was important to make sure that we use a scalable service. So static web app service is being used for that. Uh, we are even planning to um, have, uh, you know, multiple uh, services exposed in different regions. So if somebody is accessing from the US, it will hit a U service that is exposed close to the US than a service that is exposed in central India. So that process is ongoing right now. But if I try to use this platform in the US, uh, in most of the countries that we've kind of been to or that we are targeting, 
and it still works well even when everything is in central india so that's the power of cloud is is kind of what i kind of got to know and one year back when we were kind of not using uh, services to this level i mean we could really see that in different regions some regions it is very slow some region, regions it is better so with this kind of an architecture it gives a consistent level of performance throughout yeah interesting interesting yep so there uh, is one question uh, from the audience i just want to bring that up uh, so i mean do you offer any any apis for in your product where somebody else can consume it in a different way yes we offer apis um, and we are uh, So we've exposed APIs, but we've not totally opened it up to anyone and everyone. I mean, right now we are kind of generating the API keys at the back end for any partner who wants to integrate with us. Uh, but eventually, we will kind of even make this totally public, where anybody can go and they can they can do an integration. They can generate API keys, etc., on their account. But yeah, I mean, this is how somebody can request for an annotation. What all they want to do, they can specify. and this is the response object that we give and i mean so to be honest we we've, we've not really even standardized the pricing of the api so whoever we are integrating it with we kind of decide the pricing based on the engagement the uh, the volumes and so on yeah got it got it so so there is a question on there's a lot of questions on the model which you use uh, so there is one question on like fusion strategy and on and x converter converted so can you just give are you, are you using oil uh, currently no we are not okay we are not but i'll show you something i mean very very briefly to give an idea of uh, what what are the model architectures that we have i mean this has evolved over time so based on the accuracy performance we evolved it if try to use some standard services as well wherever possible just one second open it yeah uh, while you opening it i think maybe i think uh, people who don't know about onnx i think onnx or open neural network exchange actually is a kind of an interchange format think of it as interchange kind of format where uh, it, you can actually train the model on maybe say pytorch but maybe run it on maybe tensorflow or vice versa right so once you export it in uh, a uh, you know in 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 or train it in one uh, kind of framework you can use use the uh, model that is generated in another framework so you can use one uh, one kind of framework for building the model and another for inferencing so uh, yeah so it actually i mean maybe not a great analogy but i think it maybe think of it as like a sort of a jvm or jdk kind of uh, uh, you know interplay for for ai models yeah yeah so this is i mean i would probably we would even uh, write a blog on 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 something like this um, and for every model uh, what are the tools that we've used how in fact how have we evolved it over time there's a story to it uh, would want to actually even write a, an article on medium to kind of denote all of this but yes this is how it is so for frame extraction we use ffmpeg phase detection we use uh we use this we use we also do face tracking we use deep sort for that face tracking as i said is important for a uh, uh, bunch of things uh in fact beyond the point if you want to increase accuracy of a model uh there is so we use face tracking to to rule out all the uh, you know one off um, errors that are made in a, in a shot so this is why we use it For, for face recognition, we use face recognition. We use uh, SVM algorithm to recognize faces. For emotion, we use ResNet 18, ResNet 50 for face attributes. Object, we've now moved to YOLO V7. Um, for every object, for every class of object, right? So there are about in these many, I think what 570 objects that we are doing it into multiple categories. Mm-hmm. for every every class there are about 2000 images that we've collected um, so we have a very standardized process to do that we have about 50 data labeling interns at any point that keep collecting data for newer classes interesting 
again object tracking also is done action recognition is something like uh, like somebody is kicking someone or punching someone somebody is loading a gun or walking or running so all of this is rather than you know inferencing it on a still frame it is better done on a set of frames so we use about 16 frames together uh, and we run the action recognition model which is on 3d resnet then there are some scene level thing shot detection scene detection uh, place detection what, what, is, what, what is the impact like you know uh, by grouping frames together it is faster is it faster or is it more accurate uh, so you can't do you can't do something on a on a still frame like if some if you want to see if somebody is kicking someone or punching someone you have to do it on a set of frames uh, it can't be a still photo that tells you that you know this person is kicking him or he's falling down or whatever so okay. action model for us is very very important actually okay. so i'll show you what we are doing in terms of uh, what we are able to infer see this like in close combat throwing objects as intention to hurt breaking of so these are all action models interesting interesting well, it's fascinating okay. because you will be tracking objects you will be looking at you know how it kind yes. of moves to the frame as well which is very different from you know like saying that whether is a whether whether there is a bag or is is there a certain character in a frame uh, uh yeah again very interesting right because you need 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 to understand what is the motion uh, in terms of the ai as well to uh, be able to uh, get this information true yeah so while we are on this there is a question from divya actually so the question is uh can we do auto labeling using this tool i uh, say i have 1000 images and i want to multi label it and save the annotation basically to build a training model uh, train different models using that uh that's the question so we we haven't really uh, gone to the level where we give our users or our customers an op an option to um, automatically add a class uh, we've done it partially in terms of any faces that are not recognized by reflection um, we show it plus we show all the clustered faces in unknown face section and then uh, there is a flow there is a workflow where somebody can give the person a name uh, and we uh, for any video that has been uploaded on that account we check if uh, that face is present and we change the name so, so partially we do that but we have not really gone to that level where we give somebody an option to do it but in future it will definitely happen um, but as i said i mean what we are doing right now is very specific to the media problem so if somebody is actually trying to solve some problem in the media and entertainment space i think we would be the best choice probably one of the best uh, to use but if somebody wants to do anything which is generic i think an azure or an aws is a better choice of of api to kind of use and they also provide these tools where uh, training etc can happen very easily but we yeah. currently our annotation is done manually so with regards to faces we have some level of automation but with regards to objects and other things there is a manual annotation layer that needs to be done this is why we need more people to kind of annotate for us got it so we can just take one more question from audience if if there are any questions just last question um so any, any anything you have vinayak while we are waiting for the last question to come in you have any any final thoughts no i think i think the level of detail i think was uh, was amazing to know right like for example the action scenes or even the, i mean i was looking reading uh, even though we did talked about the romance uh, i mean the evolution i think all of it was very fascinating because i think uh, this is what we kind of aim for in this uh, uh, session also right to get a sense of what is why those choices were made how the team evolved and uh, i think what i think what also current story also tells us is that you know how those like you know how different customers when they onboarded the decisions they made had an impact both on the architecture and uh, the team and also i think uh, in some sense i think also the limitations of the platform itself right like now for example uh, even if you look at the data part right i think uh, postgres is like really good at something and then slowly you know for some other probably like the metadata stuff and fast retrieval they are using like redis as the cache so to see that kind of specialization to see that kind of evolution was i think very very interesting so um, i mean we do often talk to startups but i think especially in this episode i think i think this aspect was kind of came out very strongly that you know how how it has evolved over a period of time um and also i think in terms of uh, maybe like the 
uh, specialization in terms of the services as well, right? Um, uh, you know, how, how it has kind of happened, uh, how, how they're kind of doing deployments uh, as well. I think uh, all of that is, I think, very illustrative of, you know, how a team grows because we kind of talk about this inflection point, right? I think current talk about, you know, like the, I think the inflection point typically is, I think maybe you around the 10 people mark or the 15 people mark. And then as you grow, uh, you tend to specialize. And also I think you need to have a more robust system in terms of deployment also, because if you don't have that, then, um, then you face challenges in like the predictability, uh, you know, for specific customers. So, uh, I, I think it's great. It's great. I think, and, and I'm known current for a, a while and I've seen that evolution personally in, uh, in him and his team. And I think also in the architecture. So I think, uh, those are the aspects I think in this conversation we wanted to bring out because yeah, I, every I think, let, let me just kind of interrupt you. I think you had a big role to play. I'll be very honest. Like I'm not even, uh, kind of reaching out too far. You had a very, very big role to play. I think I remember that in 2020 early, just before COVID, we had gathered in uh, Goa, right, for the boot camp yeah. for Microsoft for startups. That is where I think that was a big turning point in our life. Uh, a lot of our people, actually, we got five people from our team. Uh, we were only asked to get two. Uh, all of them came. They learned so much. I think you, Ashwin, few other people who were there from your team really helped us. Uh, we started thinking about scale, about how to use these kind of cloud services, features, etc. And before that, we kind of only worked on monolith. And in fact, service-oriented architecture was also something that we started in 2020. So yeah, big, big thanks to you and the team at Microsoft for startups. No, it's good to hear. I think we we played a small part in this like large story, right? I think credit goes to you, I think, uh, because different people take away different things and happy to play that small role in this overall story. So what do you, Vivek, uh, if there are any questions, we can take them. Uh, we are, I think we over time, actually, but the conversation was yeah. so interesting. We didn't want to kind of stop as well. So. so as we always say, right, in Scale Up Thursday, each time there's a new startup, we see magic of tech. <laughs> so it's always get interesting. Each time there's a new startup coming and sharing the, you know, their story, it is getting more and more interesting. We're just going over time. Every time we have this Scale Up Thursday, like last time it was one hour, 10 minutes, now one hour, 20 minutes. Now. Probably next next one will go one hour, 30. 30 minutes so that's what it is <laughs> okay cool and uh, i think we are out time uh, you can obviously uh, you know reach out to vinayak or to me or to karan if you have any specific questions uh, and we are all happy to help uh, help here and uh, i would just like to thank uh, karan for coming here and sharing all these details uh, thank you karan for being on scale up thursday show and we would love to uh, probably i think uh, there should be a part two of this as well because there are so many things involved in this uh, whole discussion because you know we talked about functions we talked about kubernetes cluster and probably i'm also interested in how you do devops and uh, you know how how uh, how how are those uh, things been built and what is your team structure there maybe this this whole startup needs a part two of this so anyways uh, we will think about it later but yeah uh, thank you vinayak for uh, coming in and uh, sharing the uh, details with us and thanks karan thank you rashmita for hosting thank you audience for joining in and we will have one more startup uh, in coming weeks i think on 23rd uh, do join us as well uh, that's also an interesting startup and and we will have an amazing discussion thank you all thank you all for being here thank you everyone thank you for bye, the everyone. opportunity bye thank see you see you in the next show bye can bye, bye. bye.